So now, let me uh, turn to the first panel on balancing trust and risk. Please welcome our moderator, Stefan Savage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when I was coming out here today, uh, someone said to me, oh, you're, you're on the depressing panel. Uh, <laughs> but after Wendy led with um, end of the human race, I actually think that we're going to be kind of a, a positive, a, a, have a positive spin on this. So um, let me introduce, let me ask my panelists uh, to come out, and I'll introduce them to come. So uh, Dana Boyd, who is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research, a visiting professor at Georgetown, works at the intersection of technology and society. James Mickens, associate professor at Harvard, the University of Harvard, that's how you call it, right? That's uh, right. <laughs> uh, works on software security. Um, Michel boudouin uh, Lafont, professor at the uh, Université Paris-Saclay, uh, HCI researcher, but also vice president on the ACM Technology Policy Council, and it's going to talk about the, uh, represent some of the roles that Europe has played in technology policy around these issues, and Brian Ford at EPFL, who's an associate professor focused on decentralized, that's the nice way we say it, decentralized systems. Um, <laughs> So um, when, when Jennifer introduced the panel, she said she had this rhetorical question, which was, so should we, should we trust those computers? And uh, which I found you know, a really interesting question. We don't usually say it about, you know, should we, should we trust those books? Or should we trust the, you know, DC motors or printed circuit boards and so forth? And I think part of it is because we endow com computers as being this very, this complex thing that captures a lot of different uh, purposes that we put in them. And so with that, I'd like to kind of open it up to what, what do we think are, when we talk about trusting things, trust for what? What are the different risks that you think are most important for us to consider when we're talking about this balance of trust and risk in, in, in computing? Sure. I mean, I'm happy to jump into this. Um, trust is something that I have spent a lot of time playing with over the years. And for what it's worth, people did not trust books. There's a long history of people not trusting books. In fact, for good reason. And see Florida. Um, so they're not trusting books even now. Um, so I, um, the thing that's important to realize about trust, and from a sociological place, we often talk about this as socially constructed, which generally makes everybody else roll their eyes. Um, but the basic idea is that when we think about trust, we actually think about social structure. So, and I'm going to get to your question because the thing about trust is that trust, it doesn't just come out of thin air. It has to do with how things are related to one another. There's relationships and networks between people and the object, between people as they're related and around the object. You can think of it in this network sense. And this is why trust for what is really often do we like the social structure that we're in? Uh -huh. Do we trust the institutions, the objects, to be a part of this? Or when is this disruptive to the structures that we live within? And what are the consequences of those disruptions? And in many ways, when we deal with instability, that is the moment of massive societal distrust. And it's where we have this form of anxiety, this insecurity, this what is going to happen. And the other thing that's really, for me, challenging about tr trust, and I, I appreciate Wendy's, um, you know, what did she call it, the Moscow model, which is like, just create chaos. Because the best way to really destabilize the social configuration is to make it so that we don't trust anything. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is where I keep coming back to this, is like, what is that instability? Right, so I was talking with, um, with Butler ahead of this, and the question that he posed to me is, well, why do we trust vaccines? It's probably not because we've all gone and read the research and done the experiments to verify that, that they work. Alternatively, why do some people not trust vaccines? And it has nothing to do with the fact that they have come up with counterexamples to those experiments. But it's, it's very much that we've attached it to, to this larger social structure. So 
that brings up this other question, what could one do? Because you know, part of ACM's role is to, is to guide. What could one do to increase trust in computer systems? What are the elements that go into that? How much of that is, is, can be done technically? How much of that is, is a policy issue? Yeah, so I think, is my microphone on? Can everyone hear me? Great. I want to open by saying it's approximately 17 degrees in this room. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Georgia. My life systems are close to shutting down. So if I expire on the panel, it's been great being a part of the ACM community. Uh, second of all, in my last remaining moments of life, I'd like to address the question that was posed. So I think that um, a lot of it has to do with sort of education writ large about how we teach people about technology both people who are going to go on to be engineers and then as people who are just going to be in the world using technology. And so like when I was in college, for example, when I thought about security, I thought about, you know, hacker movies. I thought about, you know, opening sockets up to 128 bit keys and stuff like that. And I was like, that is security. But then when you look at things like, um, you know, why don't people trust vaccines? Or, you know, why don't people trust, let's say, an app that's on their phone to collect medical data or, you know, warn them, like, have they been in contact with people who have COVID? I think the trust really, you know, getting to the points that you were mentioning, it's embedded in a social context. And that's a context that we need to teach engineers about, for example, so that when they're designing products, they're not just thinking about, you know, I'm worried if my phone gets stolen. Maybe we should be worried about, well, the phone doesn't get stolen, but the person who's using it doesn't trust the app developer, doesn't trust the context in which the data is being collected and stored and analyzed. And so for me, that's actually one of the biggest challenges right now in sort of how we teach security, that a lot of times we focus purely on the um, pure computational aspects, if you will, but not, a much, not as much on that wider social context. Well, I would like to take the other side of this, which is, yes, it's important that people understand how technology works. But even for those of us who understand it, uh, we also find ourselves sometimes without right means to, to control it. And so if you look at it from a public policy perspective, how you know, can a government uh, sort of help its citizens feel more trustworthy uh, in the technology that they use or uh, less, have less risk? Um, I think it's important to think th of it as social technical systems. Uh, the technology doesn't come, you know, falls from the sky. It's built by humans for other humans. Uh, but the means of those who build the technology and those who use it are not the same. And I think if you look at what's happening in Europe, uh, we all know now the GDPR. We will all hear soon about the Digital Market, Digital Services Act. We hear, heard a little bit about the AI Act is how can we, now that these technologies are sort of well established, how can we enact some kind of regulation uh, to build up this trust? Because with the example of vaccines, it's like you sort of trust the uh, organization that does not the testing necessarily, but looks at the results of the test and say, well, we approved the way it was done and all that. Uh, when we put a car on the road, you know, the, the car maker has to follow some regulations. So it seems to me that it's all but natural, that I mean, it is perfectly natural that when you put out uh, a new technology like AI or uh, social networks or whatever, uh, at some point people can trust it because they also trust the authority that said it was okay to, to use. But, but what's, the, what's the limit on that, sorry, Brian? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. At, at, uh, uh, I, I can go after after you if you wanted to say something, but anyway. oh, so, so I was just where, where do you think the limits on regulation are with respect to this? Because a lot of trust is is history, right? We have some experience that we we haven't been screwed over for a while, and so that's what causes us to think that something is okay. Like, the reason that I feel comfortable driving a car in the United States is not because I think the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration does such a good job and I'm like, on t then they're on top of it. It's because, you know, I don't see so many car crashes that I'm afraid to go out. And so, like, there's some things it seems like one can do from, with, from a regulatory standpoint, but there must be a limit where it's like, no, that can't, it can't, we can't hand it all to policy people and say, solve our, solve our problem. Absolutely, and, and it is 
I mean, there is sort of a coevolution between you know, uh, the users, the makers of technology, and their organizations and governments that, that regulate. Uh, and yes, it's also a social construct. But um, I think if you take GDPR, uh, you know, I, I don't quite trust the, these buttons you click to say, I don't want cookies. Uh, and in fact, there's a bunch of studies that show that even once you click that button, uh, the, the website is still collecting data. But there's a rule that you know, if they get caught, they can be sued and, uh, and, and there's uh, uh, problems for them. So, so I think it, it's, it's part of, of the social construct. You have to start somewhere. Um, you also have to stop somewhere. And that's the whole difficulty of figuring out how to go not too far, uh, to not stifle innovation, uh, and to also not have the, some of the other models that <laughs> Wendy was talking about, where there's too much control uh, over, over citizens' life, over their privacy, and, and, and all these things. So uh, you know, I don't think there's absolute answers. It's, uh, uh, it's an evolving process. And I think uh, Europe, if you look at the process w by which they got to the Digital Services Act, for example, that regulates, uh, will regulate big platforms, there's been a lot of back and forth. Uh, and ACM, through its uh, uh, European Technology Policy Committee in particular, has been involved in, in making comments and trying to educate <laughs> our policy makers because, yes, uh, a lot of them don't understand uh, all these technologies. Uh, and that's also part of the problem. Yeah, so I, yeah, I. I um, would like to jump in. So, uh, you know, while I, I agree with a lot of what's been said so far, I also want to raise an alarm at the fact that, you know, an, an undercurrent of, of, you know, a lot of what we've been saying so far is how do we get people to trust our technology, the stuff we build, right? And this is a very biased statement. This is, you know, a group of computer scientists talking to a group of a lot more computer scientists, by, by and large. Do you see a little bit of bias there, right? <laughs> Potentially, you know, even before we bring the AI in, right? Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, we also need to ask equally importantly, in what ways are, you know, all of those other people who are not trusting technology right in not doing so, or potentially right? How do we need, uh, you know, make sure, make the technology actually more trustworthy underneath? And how do we make, uh, make sure it's, it's actually accountable, uh, you know, representative of the interests of the broader population, not us high priests, or, I, AKA computer scientists, right? Uh, you know, high priests of technology, right? Um, and, you know, to me, that's really one of the, one of the key questions we need to, uh, you know, and that's partly my, you know, kind of decentralized uh, aspect speaking. There's, of course, many, many flavors and definitions of decentralization. What does it mean? It can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it mean, can mean a lot of little things instead of one big thing. It can mean splitting trust, no single point of failure, but it also can mean a broad base of accountability, a broad representation in some ways. And I think in some, in some sense, that's the most essential. We need to figure out um, how we can you know, not, not just kind of get people to trust technology, but make it actually trustworthy and representative of the broad base, not just what us computer scientists like to build and think is trustworthy from our perspective. I think one of the things I want to add to this is also what we deal with when we're dealing with scale. So it's fun to be here in San Francisco. And one of the things that I remember being in this neighborhood in 2002, when everybody's building all these new systems, and where they conned their five friends into like do, working with the system. Right? Social media in its early days, for example, grew very, very slowly. You got invited by a friend and a friend and a friend, and you got brought into this process. And the scale allowed for this moment of actually, actually negotiating out, like, do you like the system? What do you not like the system? Do you want to change the system, et cetera? And that was the story of a lot of different technologies over a lot of different time. Now that we're living in an environment with a massive amount of capital and a belief that we actually should scale things really fast, that disrupts a lot of these trust issues in a significant way. And I remember the first time we ran into it when I was um, working on uh, Gmail at Google. And it was this realization that if we just opened it up to everybody, people would flood in and be like, WTF, I'm out. And so it was this very purposeful decision at the time to try to roll it slowly in order to have this sort of negotiation. But that's really hard right now. And this goes back to your, you know, the roads and other things. When we move so fast, when we scale a country, when we pull people together really fast, 
we don't necessarily know how to do trust at scale in the same way that we know how to do it when it becomes part of a negotiation. And one of the things I think, you know, and I think your point is right, like, you know, we're, we're loving technologies and we think that the technology is the only thing that matters, but there's something to say about what's the technology within this broader environment and what does it mean that we're trying to scale every piece of technology so fast in a way that I would argue is just really destabilizing. Yeah, I'd also argue too that like transparency is not the same as understandability, right? So in other words, like even if the code's all open source, like that doesn't necessarily mean that we know what's going on. I mean, so for example, like uh, sometimes I talk to folks at the business school, right? And, they, and I ask them these questions. I say, hey, so how are you complying with GDPR, for example? And all of a sudden the mood gets tense. <laughs> and they say, let's go talk in this hallway for yeah. a second. <laughs> and the beads of sweat start coming down their forehead. And they say, we got four paralegals and a pearl script, and my God, I'm going to jail. That's what they <laughs> say. And like one reason it's challenging for them to comply sometimes is that even if they think they know the law, and they think they know, here are the places in our system that are manipulating data, it's just a complicated system, right? It's hugely scalable. Not everybody's coordinating. And so the mere fact that we could say like, oh, here's the source code, here's the ingress, here's the egress, doesn't necessarily tell us, should we have confidence in those results? And I think that's sort of like a fundamental way that we have to change how engineering gets done. Because if we focus first on continuous integration, scaling immediately, you know, nothing's catching on fire all the time, then it's hard for us to sort of step back and say, here's what it actually means, what we're doing. Here's how things are actually operating. It's a very complex system, and it's hard to have trust in those types of systems. But are these systems really more complex than designing a new car, a new plane, or a nuclear plant? I mean, is there an exception to what we do that, that means it should be different? Yes. <laughs> OK. But I would also say that with those systems, we, there's a whole history of testing. We lost quality assurance 20 years ago as a field. There's a, in sociology, there's this great concept called normal accidents theory. I don't know if folks are familiar with it. It was basically what happened when people went in to try to study what happened at Three Mile Island, which was a, a near nuclear meltdown, and said, okay, who were the bad actors that did bad things, right? And the, the people who went in to do the postmortem were like, oh, there weren't bad actors. It's a very, very, very complex system at scale with a lot of tightly coupled components in all of it such that when you have something like that, so many things can become brittle. And when they become brittle, it's a normal accident, just one small thing that can ripple the whole way through. And I think that this is really important when we think about these complex like, technical systems when we build them at scale. Because we know that half of them are Perl scripts, right? Like they're, they're brittle to begin with. You add money, you add an obsession with efficiency, and you add scale, and it's just like, it's that much duct tape, like it's kind of a miracle that the thing runs, and that's where it's to your car point, where it's just like, that should not be on the road, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so how do we deal with that moment where we have to sit back and be like, duct tape should not be at scale, like, or we're going to create a societal level normal accident. Well, there are alternatives, right? You have, if you look, for example, at how software is engineered for a modern airplane, they don't do it that way. And, and in fact, you know, a lot of that software is unchanged from the late 80s, early 90s, precisely because it is so expensive for them to go over and check and verify and so forth. And that's an alternative, but in exchange, we give up the richness of the systems that we have today, because you, you can't, you, it's not move fast and break things, you can't, you, you can barely move. Um, so, uh, but, yeah. yeah. I was being devil's advocate here <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Um, but, but yeah, and I think the thing is that, you know, with Three Miles Island or a car uh, where you have a massive recall because they discovered a, a problem, the, the, the problem is clear. There was an accident. Maybe people died. Uh, and uh, I think one question with uh, uh, computer systems like social networks and stuff is like, what is bad? What, what is we don't want to happen? Uh, is fake news uh, really bad, or is it that we call it fake news because we want it to look bad? Um, and so I think there's also the question of, of uh, how you decide what is the uh, um, uh, sort of uh, the normal operating <laughs> mode of these systems. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's also something that is co-constructed uh, uh, socially. Well, yeah, if I can you know, jump in on, on that point, I, you know, I think that's in fact, one of the, you know, how people perceive, how people decide 
whom to trust, about what to trust, right? Because people, you know, most people, are, again, are not computer scientists. They're never going to decide these things on their own. They're going to decide who to listen to, whether to listen to friends or an organization they trust or experts somewhere else that they trust or other institutions or what they hear on their social media or whatever. These are all, you know, major methods of people's perceptions and, and especially the you know, the, uh, many of the you know, collective perception mechanisms that we as computer scientists tend to be most responsible for and often most excited about, these you know, can be some of the, some of the most dangerous, as, uh, as we've seen. You know, we are, messing with, um, we are messing with our collective ability to perceive correctly um, or incorrectly, uh, and our collective uh, ability to, you know, act and, you know, collectively think and collectively act in reasonable, rational ways or, or not be able to, right? And this is an extremely, you know, kind of this collective perception is an, ex you know, an extremely element, uh, critical, essential element, you know, just as critical as the safety of our food supply, right? For example, right? Of course, you know, coming back, every time I come back to the U.S. from Europe, I'm reminded that, well, not everything isn't all, all you know, peaches and, you know, cream there either. Uh, but still, right, you know, uh, it, this, this is, you know, how people perceive and, you know, how these methods of collective perception work, the, uh, uh, you know, news feeds and all of that is, I would argue, so essential that we should be taking it just as seriously as we take it, uh, the, you know, the creation of food or the construction of airplanes, right? And so, if we need, if that, if it means that it, that needs to innovate more slowly, or at least innovate, you know, allow innovation, you know, rapid innovation in small sandboxes, but slow things down before we roll it out to billions, then maybe we should do that. So security is a tough field because it basically, the umbrella covers everything in which after something bad happens, someone is expected to say they're sorry. And so I actually think we have two different kinds of problems here. There are problems about does a system do what it's designed to do, roughly speaking, not in a formal sense, but like if we look at it and we say, oh yeah, I wasn't supposed to do that. And that's in the, you know, the Perl scripts and does it fall over and make the airplane crash kind of space. And then there's, when used as intended, Q-tip style, it will cause damage. <laughs> and that, I think, is a different class of problem because it's not that, that someone is subverting the design or that it, wasn't, uh, that the, it wasn't technically built with proper care. It's that, that how we use it, in fact, is, is detrimental. And, and I don't know, do you think we can engage with those two different classes of problems the same way? Or do you think that those, in fact, are different things? I mean, yes, where I jump into this is, is there's a lot of thinking about what is deterministic, right? So, which is to say, if X, then Y um, is, you know, we usually believe that if I just, if I put this piece of technology in, magical good things will happen. And of course, we've gotten to a critical tech lash mindset where it's like, if X, then Y prime. So if I put this technology in, terrible things will happen. And these polarities sort of miss the point, right? Because whenever you build an intervention into a system, into a society, all sorts of things, both like desirable and desirable, come out, right? And the, the intervention actually makes certain futures more possible, more easy, you know, more obtainable, and certain futures harder. Right? And what's challenging, and this is why I point out the, the loss of QA, is that you don't always know. You dream, you hope. The process of innovation is definitely one of hoping. The process of security is one of fearing. And this question then is, how do you actually work through this and how do you iterate? And I think this goes back to this question of speed and friction. And I think that one of the challenges that when you add, and, I, and I, you know, we're in this environment talking about you know, computing, but we cannot talk about computing in this modern environment without talking about the capital inflection that's really shaped all of this. Because when the goal is to put to make money out of it, when the whole thing, the whole system is financialized, the goal is to move it as fast as possible and for it to either succeed or fail and not have to think about the changes to the systemic process. Because it's a question of how much money can you make in a short term. And I think that has changed our field tremendously in the last 75 years, right? 
many of us are still very, very geeky, um, for which I, I heart all of you. Um, but this is something that we're, like, right now, like, the, the Silicon Valley environment that I started out in was one with geeky passions and dreams and hopes and fascinations. Now this town is all about who can turn a buck real fast. And I think that's the thing that makes those, that, that tension you're dealing with more complicated because so much of it has become about money. But isn't there a see also a tension in the fact that in a business model that is uh, funded by advertising, the incentives for the companies are not the same as uh, are not you know same as you know in selling cars or, or products. You don't want necessarily to make the consumer happy. You want to make the consumer hooked up so it can be exposed more ads and, and, and click uh, more often. And so I think uh, that that's a, that's a difficulty that. Uh, again, we have this imbalance between uh, the makers of the technology and the users, uh, made worse by the fact that you have these monopolies, de facto monopolies. But I think this is where I don't think it's simply the business model. I think that's where we lost. I think it's the financialization. It's the idea that the goal is return on investment and what are the different ways and the different mechanisms. Most of the, the folks who are manufacturing got taken over by private equity before this. So we've had such a financialized structure where it's not even, like even when we talk about advertising, advertising of the 50s is very different than advertising of today. The goal isn't just about making the money about advertising, it's about that hockey stick. And it's the hockey stick that concerns me, not even the simple like, can you be profitable? Because these companies that are making money off of advertising, it's not about whether or not they can stay profitable, it's about whether or not they can insidiously grow like cancer. Yeah, but the... <laughs> And, and to do that, they do massive uh, behavior control of their users. So they stay hooked up on their, on their uh, news feed, et, et cetera. Uh, this is great. So, We're gonna I mean, this is one <laughs> problem. It's not the, the entire problem, well, but I think it's a significant one. And, and, the, and the users don't have a choice. Uh, one of the things uh, that will come up in, in again, this European uh, Act is uh, more interoperability, which raises issues in security, and we all know that, but we'll probably, you know, uh, create incentives to solve those problems. Um, and I think users have no choice uh, uh, also is, is, is uh, becoming uh, sort of an issue. So all these things together, of course, it's not simple. <laughs> so, uh, so let me play devil's advocate. I don't know. I'm playing devil's advocate, but that mar market dominance is, is good for at least that first kind of security. All right? And the, the argument well, goes as follows, <laughs> that um, we are sadly not in a good position to measure security. And so as a result, it is not a competitive feature of almost any product or service that we sell. And so while you are in a competitive market, everyone is running as fast as they can to get market share and do features. And no one thinks about security until they have taken over. And we've seen this in, we saw this in PCs, we see this in cell phones, the security comes after market dominance is achieved because that is the time we can afford it. And so that, that's you know, arguably the other side of this. Before we have that, there's, you, you're never gonna get an IoT company to put money into security because that's just gonna take away from the likelihood that they will survive another six months. Okay, but if you, if you rely on basically market centralization to finally achieve security, what kind of security are you achieving at that point? And in particular, security in whose interests, right? Is it security you know, for, you know, for uh, everyone, all of the users, or is it really you know, mainly security for the security of the you know, market dominating player, right? You know, for their interests, right? Um, and, and, you know, and I, I think uh, this, you know, the, the business model, the incentive model is fundamentally extremely important, uh, you know, and I guess coming back to the, the food in industry illustration, you know, we've seen the effects of allowing, you know, industry to, uh, to follow, uh, you know, uh, largely follow in the incentives to try to create, uh, say, fast food addicts, you know. And that's exactly what a lot of our centralized, uh, you know, kind of information-based, uh, you know, news feeds and th this kind of model is 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 deliberately creating in uh, the computer uh, in the computing realm. It it's trying to create, you know, uh, you know, click addicts, uh, you know, screen time addicts, uh, and and it's doing that right. And it, and if that remains, if that is allowed to remain the business model, it's going to keep doing that, you know. 
just like you know, we, we, we still have a fast food addict, uh, you know, addiction problem and, and other addiction problems in other industries, and we need to be willing to deal with that. This is great. We're about to dismantle late stage capitalism in this panel. <laughs> I'm very excited about this direction. <laughs> ACM 75th University. It's great. So, so I think this is all correct. I think that like when we talk about trust and security, really we're just talking about anything that's not directly related to that hockey stick uh, growth curve. Right? I mean, I think it's very interesting, and maybe like you and many people on this panel, when I go talk to former or current students who are you know, in Silicon Valley or in startups, right, this whole notion of pivoting, that I'm just gonna give up on this thing I was doing just because the money's now over here, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Like if you had a dream in your heart, and then all of a sudden you're like, no, nah, I'm just doing this other dream which is one over my former dream, I pivoted. You know, it's strange, why do they do that though? Because that's where sort of the money is, that's where the market forces are. And so I think that like when you think about security, that's just sort of one instance of uh, a societally desirable characteristic we might want from our technology that's not currently being pushed by the system. And so, you know, at least in my mind, there's sort of two places we have levers on that, either on the people who are funding stuff, so like the VC people, and or on the people who are building stuff, you know, our students, our practitioners who are out there. Um, and so I think it's important for people to be given that type of moral imagination. That's what I really think it comes down to because if you're not thinking about these things mm -hmm. when you're designing systems, they're not just gonna emerge magically. Well, that gets us back to education. <laughs> How, what do we teach our students? You know, I work in HCI, uh, Human Computer Interaction, and uh, we get students at the master's level um, and they're all interested in technology and uh, the human values and the, the design processes that you need to create more humane AI, among other things, or human, humane systems, uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, should be taught a lot earlier in, in, uh, in the curricula. Um, and and uh, so there's this one end. And there is this other end, which is uh, those who, who, who the, the policy uh, makers also need to be educated. Um, and uh, I think this, uh, you know, I'll put a plug here for ACM and the uh, uh, new ACM uh, Technology Policy Council has put out the Tech Briefs. And Tech Briefs is a new publication, um, you know, a, a four page uh, uh, leaflet that uh, we have three out uh, so far, one on facial recognition, one on smart cities, and one on climate change. And it's targeting, uh, you know, people in Washington, as you would say here, or for us people in Brussels, um, and uh, maybe people in London for, for, for Wendy. Um, and uh, part of this is, is right, really trying to uh, educate the policymakers into the intricacies of technology because they often have very uh, sort of uh, broad strokes uh, <laughs> of, of what's possible and what's not. Um, and if we don't do that, then we won't have the right, uh, the right type of regulation. And so, part so, of so let me follow up because one of the questions is very apropos. So, um, and it's about regular people understanding the impact of technology. And um, we currently, the way a lot of regulations are written is we uh, live under the hegemony of informed consent. That is, if you can get informed consent, you can do any full thing that you want. And so I'm wondering if you have thoughts about, is there a way to educate out of that? Or in fact, is conform, informed consent part of the problem? That, that in fact, simply saying that informed consent is sufficient to allow anything to happen is, is, is doomed, or can we educate people to the point where they can truly make informed technology decisions every time they are asked? Well, I think that informed consent, uh, we haven't found a better way, uh, but you also need people to be able to uh, see if they can trust uh, the, the, the company or the provider uh, with uh, the, the consent you've given them. And so but it's like it means 17 having access, pages long. Well, <laughs> Because, of all the things I agreed to. <laughs> you know, in the deployment of GDPR, we've seen uh, an evolution in that, of course, uh, people don't like to not be able to leave cookies uh, in your web browser, so they, may, they, they try to trick you to click the wrong button. Uh, or you have to click 27 or 2700 buttons to say, no, I don't want this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. Now, normally, now you have to have a button to say, I refuse everything. So, so again, it's, it's a construction. Um, and I guess the thing I would layer to it, like, I, I think we can all point out places where corporations have done creepy and weird things that like mess with people on informed consent. But a informed consent is also within a context of, you know, what are the power dynamics at play? So, you know, I study children. 
what does it mean to give parents informed consent over their child? Like that works out great when there's a really healthy relationship. It is really terrible when we're dealing with unhealthy right. relationships. I know later today we're going to be talking about trafficking-based dynamics. You do not want those parents to be giving consent over the child. Those parents are the ones who are selling the child into trafficking. So like, what are some of the configurations and where does it work? And where do we also have to deal with precarity? Um, and like, one of the things I often think about is you know, in some of my interviews with companies and when people saw things going wrong in companies and couldn't speak up, in the United States it's amazing how many of those laborers who see things are you know, contractors who feel like they have no power in the situation, immigrants who can't lose their visa, right? And so what does it mean we also place people into configurations where they have a form of precarity where they can't speak up? And what does it also mean that many of our situations are now networked, they're relational? You know, I may want to participate in genetic activities and I may be able to consent myself into it, but I've implicitly consented my entire family into it. What does that mean? So I think that we should look, and again, I agree, like informed consent has its purpose, it has its place, but we can't just be done with that checkbox. We have to actually understand it within a broader system of power and like, where, like basically keep your eyes on precarity and keep your eyes on vulnerability. And if you keep your eyes on there, you'll see where those places do not actually play out as intended. Mm. Yeah, if I can add to that, I think you know, I, I, I think informed consent can you know can work as a you know can be a useful tool, but it has to go with uh, like you know there has to be a reasonable granularity, and and some kind of reasonable uh, you know structures or institutions on which that can set standards like community standards or whatever kind of standards that people can reasonably make decisions about. So you know. So that you know, each person is not expected to read the 17 pages, but you know, can uh, you know, can uh, identify with, oh, well, this this meets this you know well-known you know community standard by this organization, I mean, maybe ACM. You know, th this is this is the kind of thing that uh, you know not uh, you know nonprofit uh, industry uh, groups can be uh, you know uh, uh, can potentially do. Um, you know, kind of creating reasonable granula uh, you know, granularities and, and labels and, and, and standards for, for these kinds of things to, to operate on, you know, that, that allow people to, to just say, well, okay, yeah, I trust the ACM or this, this other organization uh, in its, you know, kind of branding of this as a reasonable, uh, you know, a configuration to use, as opposed to, you know, I'm going to read that, those 17 pages, right? No, I, I, w I would love it if there was a way that I could, like, the same way I do with voting, and be like, League of Women Voters, please configure my browser, mm. because, or Sierra Club, or whatever, that would be great. Um, so we have another question, and I'm going to start with Dana on this one, but it's, it's about your point about financialization. And the question is, do you have and actually it goes to any of you, insight about what makes our field different with respect to that than other industries? Why have they not faced exactly these same issues? So in many ways, I, I think that they have, but they faced it in different ways, right? Like we often, like, I love when these moments we're gonna blame Craigslist um, for destroying newspapers. It's like, no, there's such a really fascinating history on this, right? And the most recent history that's relevant is, is the private equity takeover of the newspaper industry because they had property. It was about real estate and then it was just about driving those things into the ground when they couldn't give an ROI. So the difference there is we saw a complete destruction of an industry. Our industry, uh, the, the, the technology companies that are adjacent to us, um, that industry, grew up in response to the private equity takeovers of the 1980s. So actually every aspect of how the stocks and the IPOs were structured, were structured in response to this. This gives people unprecedented power, right, where you can't even get rid of um, an executive. And this is, I mean, we're watching this full stop between, you know, Facebook, which structured its stock in a very particular way to make it very difficult to oust people, versus Twitter, um, which continues to be fascinating. Um, so, whew, um, but, so this is these moments where we have these things that are structured in response to it. We also have an industry which um, grew up, again, in response to these environments where most of our elite staff are paid in, or compensated in a way that is actually related to the financialized mechanism, right? So how many people who work at companies have a, you know, a stake in the company, whether we're talking pre-IPO or post-IPO, and what does that mean? What that also means, and which we've watched, is that like the companies are incentivized to keep, let's just say, the machine learning talent 
as happy as possible and make certain that that ROI continues because otherwise they leave to another company where the ROI is better. So this has completely configured actually our staffing structures for many of our talents. So we're living in this environment. Like most companies do not actually have it so that their employees' compensation is entirely tethered to the same ROI structure at, at elite, elite levels. Um, so there's a couple of things like that that are actually playing out where I would argue what we're dealing with is just the fact that we are a very early, you know, in, in response to this latest stage of financialization, but we're seeing it in biotech, we're seeing it in new companies that actually have similar dynamics because this is all in the United States, a whole set of deregulations post-80 private equity dynamics. Sorry. No, that was that was that was great. Feel, I might have feelings about this topic. We would never have guessed. No, I know. Well, with that, our timer is counting down to zero. So I'm going to take this opportunity to thank all of my panelists and thank all of you for uh, your attention during this time. Thank you very much.